All right. Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to today's Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants event. My name is Joe Grabowski, and I'll be your host for today. Today, we've got a really exciting event lined up. We are heading live to the spectacular tall ship Pelican of London, and we're going to get presented a wonderful summary of the findings of the Darwin 200 2021 voyage and the Great British Water Project. So over the last 13 weeks, the Darwin 200 ship has sailed all around the UK, doing all kinds of amazing surveys from plastics to whales, marine life, uh, and everything in between. And we're really lucky today to have Stuart McPherson joining us. He is the Darwin 200 Project Lead. He's an award-winning author of over 35 natural history books and the presenter of numerous wildlife TV documentaries. And he's led dozens of expeditions around the world each year and even discovered 35 new species. So I'm gonna bring Stuart in live with us now from the Pelican. Hey, Stuart, how you doing? Good morning, it's lovely to speak to you. Oh, absolutely, Stuart, it's great to see you. It looks like a beautiful day in London. Yes, it's, the sun is shining and um, the water's great here. So no, all very good. Well, oh. thank you so much for joining this joint event between Darwin 200 and the Great British Water Project which is a project by the Don Hansen Charitable Foundation. Today, we're going to be presenting the results of the four main surveys that we've been undertaking around the UK. The teams on board, we've had up to 90 uh, trainee sailors and young scientists on board the ship, and they've been undertaking a series of research projects studying whales and dolphins, seabirds, plastics, and sea search marine biology surveys. We're gonna be presenting the results of all of those findings today. The ship is right behind me and we're gonna show you a little tour of her in a second. After we've covered the Darwin 200 results, we're going to look at the, the results from the Great British Water Box Project. This is a resource project that's been sent to 650 schools right the way across the UK to study the ecology and habitats of ponds and freshwater ecosystems, um, the, the chemistry of tap water, and many other very important aspects relating to freshwater and freshwater ecosystems. And we're very, very honored at 11 o'clock to have Dr. Jane Goodall, one of the most inspiring and incredible environmental conservationists in the world joining us. Um, so she's going to be, uh, be, be talking to us at, at 11 o'clock in roughly an hour. Firstly, before we go to the presentations, I just wanted to, to put out a, an enormous thank you to the sponsors that made all of these projects possible. The Don Hansen Charitable Foundation, the Avangrid Foundation, IMC, Credit Force, Soracom, and City to Sea. We're immensely grateful to all of our wonderful partners for making this possible. Well, this is the ship, the beautiful and historic Pelican of London. Um, she's a 46 meter long um, barkentine with three masts. The, the participants of the voyage, I'll just walk you down so you can see her. The participants of the voyage have been undertaking this journey, sailing the ship right the way around the British archipelago. Um, they've had some rough weather, they've had some good weather, they've had sunsets, they've had everything. Um, they've seen some pretty amazing sights from Bast Rock, one of Europe's largest seabird colonies, to seals, dolphins, even some orcas right up in the Orkney Islands. So we'll see a bit more of the ship later. Um, but this is the research vessel, that this is the ship that we've been using to undertake this, these research projects. Well, I'm going to hand over now to each of the four research teams to talk about their important findings and what they've learned during the voyage. Thanks so much, Stuart. Hi, everyone. Uh, Joe Morley here from City to Sea. We are an environmental not-for-profit and we run campaigns to oh, stop plastic pollution, of course. Our campaigns focus on tackling single-use plastic items most found on our beaches, rivers and oceans. Hi everyone, my name is Jamie. I was brought on um, to help City to Sea with this research. I'm a marine biologist and educator. And of course, this fantastic research couldn't have taken place without um, some great help and hands along the way. So yeah, big um, massive thanks um, to our research lead, Steph Lavelle, to Jazz, our campaigns manager, and to all the young scientists and the research team who helped us pull this together. 
So just to give you a really quick overview of what we set out to do, it's such a unique opportunity to be able to understand the distributions, the abundances and the sources of plastic pollution around the UK. We visited some of the most remote islands and busiest ports, as well as a number of um, protected areas. Um, so it's really important to be able to understand if plastics are making their way into the marine environment in these places. So there are three main areas that we were looking at. First of all, we were studying macroplastics, so um, conducting beach surveys to understand what is making its way onto beaches around the UK. And this is what we're going to talk through the most today. The other thing that we've looked at is microplastics. So these are tiny plastic fragments, um, things like microbeads or clothing fibers. So we've been uh, working with the brilliant dive team to collect sediment samples from on the seashore. And these will be analyzed at Southampton University um, to see what's, what's going on and if microplastics are making their way into, into the marine environment. And the other thing we've looked at is uh, port waste management. So trying to get a picture of the infrastructure for recycling and waste management at the ports around the UK as we visited them. So our methodology was very simple. We looked horizontally across the strand line on a 100 meter transect. This was to have a look at the types of plastic that were being washed up onto shore. But more importantly, we were also assessing hor um, vertically from the back of the beach down to the water line. This would give us an idea of the types of plastics and more importantly, the size of plastics that are being washed up onto our shores. Alongside this, it was important for us to understand the context of these beaches. So we were not only discussing with locals, but we were also investigating as to the exposure of the beaches, where they were located, the facilities around the area as well. So we can start to put it all into context. So what did we find? Um, we're really excited to share some of the results with you today. Obviously, these are just our preliminary findings, um, but there's some really interesting insights that have um, appeared. So on the 13 week voyage, we surveyed 47 beaches. We conducted 54 horizontal transects and 156 vertical transects, which has given us a really good data set. Um, and in total, we found six and a half thousand pieces of marine litter. And this works out at about one piece for every meter squared of the areas that we surveyed. Um, and across the voyage as well, we also visited 20 marine protected areas. So it's been really interesting to, to understand what's going on in these really special places for wildlife um, uh, as well. So what did we find? Um, so about 10% of the plastic that we found just under was consumer related single use plastic. So these are the items that we use in our day to day lives. Um, and these made up uh, just under 10%. So this is less than we would normally expect to find um, looking at global data sets. And this is probably due to the remote locations that we visited. Um, so we've been mainly in places uh, without towns and cities. Um, so it's been really interesting to see less single use plastic. Uh, we did find in total about 20, just over 20% of it was from fishing gear and rope. Um, and this is what we'd expect to see. Um, you know, this is kind of broadly where we're finding um, fishing gear all around the world. So that was really interesting. And we're going to talk you through that in a little bit more detail. And then about 25% were things like glass, um, ceramics, construction materials. Um, but then the big chunk of what we found just under half were plastic fragments. Um, so they're the little pieces of plastic that have been degraded and broken down over time um, and they're really harmful to wildlife. And then just having a really quick look at the single use plastic we found. Um, so the, the most commonly found item were caps and lids. So these are things from plastic bottles um, that make their way into the ocean and these don't degrade um, very easily. So we did find a lot of those, unfortunately. And then things like crisp and sweet wrappers, cigarette stubs, um, plastic bags and cutlery and straws. Here's a little snapshot of some of the things that we found. So lots of flushed plastics, things like wet wipes, um, also hand sanitizers. Uh, we didn't find as much PP as we expected, um, but just to give you a little picture of some of the things that we've been finding along the way. Uh, and again, these little plastic fragments, as I explained, made up about half of the, uh, the plastics that we found. Um, and these are really harmful to wildlife who mistake them as food um, and are ending up feeding them to their babies. Um, so it's a really, really harmful and quite shocking to see as they're uh, degrading and continuing to break down into smaller and smaller pieces on the beaches. 
Yeah, and a major finding was the amount of fishing gear. So as Joe said, global trends are showing that about 20% of all marine litter is made up by fishing gear. This was what we found on, across the whole of the voyage. However, in the last leg where we were surveying in more isolated areas up in the Orkneys and Shetland, over 60% of the marine litter we were finding was predominantly fishing gear. So as you can see in this image, it was made up of either these thick tangled um, bits of rope or actual nets, all the way down to those really thin strands um, that were getting caught up into the, into the topography of the beaches down into the rocks. And these will last an incredibly long time. So even after they've, they've served their purpose, they go on causing harm to wildlife. As you can see in the background here, there was a number of salmon farms in these beaches that we were surveying and so it'd be really interesting to find out the origin of some of this type of fishing gear as well sadly we were seeing evidence of how this impacts on the nature and the natural environment so this is an image of gannets they are such an iconic species around the uk these fantastic birds and unfortunately they've been either entangled and caught up in these lines. We've also got a guillemot there as well. So sometimes the birds are mistaken them to be using them as nesting materials. And unfortunately, the impact is either they're ingesting them, they're entangling them, and therefore having an effect on the species. So overall, the key insights of what we were finding was really interesting. So up in the remote locations, more fishing gear, less of that single-use plastic. As we moved further south, coming into the, into the ports in the more developed areas, this starts to shift the trend to more single-use plastic or consumer products. Some of the beaches we were looking at in these industrial areas or the sewage outlets, this is when we started to find the flush plastics, the sanitary products, the wet wipes along our beaches. Not so much PPE as in our face, um, face masks or gloves. However, that might just be in terms of time and maybe next year, you, you never know what we might find. Fewer nardles than expected. Nardles are these um, pre-production tiny bits of plastic. Again, maybe using a different methodology, we might be able to find more of those next time. Beach topography, this played a really important aspect to the types of uh, marine litter we were finding. It affects how the beaches can be manually cleaned, but also as you can see from this image, if you have a backwash of these, of these stones, this is where your ropes are getting entangled in and it becomes really difficult to actually physically remove this type of marine litter off of the beaches. So where do we go from here? Obviously, we've uh, found out some really interesting uh, information and data. Um, and as an organization, city to sea will use this uh, to shape our campaign strategy to um, help us understand where we need uh, to focus to tackle some of these really problem plastics. And we'll also use this data, this amazing imagery uh, and the research that we've carried out to help push for much needed policy changes in the UK and around the world. Um, we'll be sharing the data with other organizations and using this to really get the message out there and help to uh, tackle this issue. And our research lead, Steph Lavelle, will also be writing a number of papers and using this data to contribute to her PhD to get this information out there um, and really help to, to campaign for change. And if you'd like to find out more about our campaigns or how you can reduce single-use plastic, then do visit the city to sea website um, and find out more there. Thanks so much. And Thank it's been you. brilliant sharing this information with you today. All right. Thank you. What a great presentation. What a what a great opportunity to get to survey the plastics around the entire country. That's incredible. All right. So I know we're queuing up our next presentation. Here they come. Uh, hello. Hey, how are you? Hello there. It's lovely to be here. Uh, thank you for having me. Uh, oh, of course, of course. Thanks for joining us today. <laughs> so I guess I'll just get straight to it. One second. Yeah, if you pop up the presentation, I'll keep my eye out for it. Uh, and it looks like it might be here already. Let me check. Yep, we're good. 
Brilliant. Um, so hello, everyone. So today I want to talk to you guys about the seabirds that we found on this incredible circumnavigation of the UK on this Darwin 200 voyage by myself, the Grimali. So before I tell you about what we found, let me tell you why we should care about seabirds. Now, seabirds are an incredible indicator about the ecosystem health of many geographic locations that may seem disconnected. But in fact, due to these astonishing migration routes that these seabirds undertake each year, they are actually quite dependent on each other. For example, the Manx Shearwater undertakes migration going from our beautiful British shores down to West Africa, further down to Patagonia, going up the Caribbean. And the there was an Arctic turn that was data logged from the Fine Isles, an area that we ourselves sailed through, um, going down to the Southern Ocean and then east to the Indian Ocean, showing how these geographic locations that are so that look so disconnected are very much part of one major ecosystem therefore showing how seabirds can provide us a fantastic snapshot about the status and the current biodiversity found in many uh, locations around the world. From the surveys that we undertook, about we found 16 different seabird species and a third two were found outside of these uh, surveys. The surveys were undertaken in many locations across the British Isles. Uh, to further summarize and give you more of a contrast between the different locations, I uh, divided, in, divided them into the southwest coast, the north coast, and the southeast coast. Across, the across these sections, if you like, we found that there are two species that were ubiquitously found throughout the range in very large numbers, quite regularly actually, such as the common guillemot and northern fulmar. The latter of which we believe the reason they're doing so relatively well is because they've associated fishing boats with food resources, which is a fantastic example of how some birds have adapted themselves to benefit from our presence. Of course, this is a double-edged sword as the fishing industry is also ca uh, causing a lot of these seabirds to become decimated because of bycatch and so on. In the northern coast, we found uh, be large numbers of uh, Atlantic puffins, great skuas, Arctic terns, and black guillemots. Unfortunately, due to the fact where our boat was, uh, we very much underrepresented coastal birds such as the Arctic tern and the black guillemot and favoring more pelagic species such as the Atlantic puffin and the great skua. In the southwest coast, we found razorbills to be a lot more, uh, a lot more abundant than in any other section, if you like, of the surveys that we did. In the southeast, kitty wakes and common terns were found to be in great numbers, and we believe these to be due to the large colonies that are found in the Northumberland coast, as well as the very well monitored um, colonies of common terns in the Four Files. The very iconic gannets is actually doing really well in the UK. Uh, in these surveys, we found them to be quite sporadic in that when we found them, we found them in great abundance, and these is, this is due to the incredibly gregarious behavior, and whilst they're uncharacteristic, uncharacteristically sedentary. They're actually quite, uh, they do travel large distances every day, forage for, uh, forage for food. An average gannet would uh, travel up to 230 kilometers, but they are known to travel up to distances such as 500 or so, showing how um, dependent locations which are so vastly far away are actually quite held together by these species. There are other species that were unfortunately not as well represented. Uh, this is due to the fact that, like I said, we are a lot more pelagic and that we weren't really picking up many coastal birds because of all of our surveys were done in the open water. So species such as the herring gull, common gull, all of these species listed here weren't as well documented that we couldn't really find any discernible patterns throughout the area. There are other seabirds as well that were found outside of the survey, such as the black-headed gull and the arctic skua. Uh, the Arctic skill we know to be in decline throughout the region, and this is quite sadly due to uh, many, many threats that I'll go on to later on, um, such as resource depletion. Um, in the fishing industry, for example, they are causing many of the food resources that these birds are so dependent on to become depleted or almost decimated in certain areas. Bycatch is a real problem for a lot of these seabirds, and that they get caught in these nets. Uh, these nets that are often also used as nesting materials, as Joe very eloquently showed back in uh, the plastic presentation. Uh, climate change is also a very real problem due to the fact that there's a certain mismatch between temperatures and daylight hours, which cause their migrations to become um, 
to become ill-timed and causing a lot of these uh, reading generations to become um, decimated as well as not as productive as they could have been. And it's because of all of these many problems that 23 out of 24 species of British seabirds found in the UK are threatened at least at a national level according to the RSPB. What we can do in the future is perhaps have better coordination between the wintering and breeding ground sites of these amazing birds. Like I said, this will require um, massive coordination throughout the earth because of these incredible migration routes they take. Um, it'd be great to apply a much more circular economy to the fishing equipment uh, from the fishing industry so that these ropes aren't found in the sea at such large quantities and perhaps also save the fishing industry a lot of money as well. So there is possibilities for a win-win scenario here. Um, an increased monitoring and protection of spawning sites for many of the food resources would be incredibly helpful um, to achieve a much more sustainable future as well. Thank you. I guess we might not have any time for any questions, but uh, thank you very much. All right, thank you, Vikram. Great presentation and great to see um, examples of those species that you saw along the way. Thank you so much. Uh, and so who is next, sorry? Uh, why, why don't we go to the whales next? The whales, fantastic. Okay, cool. All right, here comes our team now. How are we doing today? We are good. I believe we need Joe for this as well, who's coming in on another. Absolutely, let me bring Joe in. Hey, Joe, how are you doing? Oh, Joe, can you unmute for us? Thanks. Hello. Hey, Joe. Nice to see a fellow Joe in the call. Lots of Joes today. <laughs> All right. I see the presentation. I'm going to pop it in for you, and we're ready to go. Cool. So, basically, over this 13 week voyage, we've undertaken a marine vertebrates and cetaceans project. So why have we done this? Basically, it's to improve the future protection of marine vertebrates and cetaceans from UK waters and to collect valuable data and really to understand how they use our waters and how we can basically future enforce conservation measures. So what did we find? So we found incredible diversity. We saw over 58 dolphins, 35 whales and 45 porpoises. And that's not to mention other large vertebrates such as seals and sunfish. Again, over the course of 13 weeks, we had 155 sightings, uh, which was an improvement on last year where we saw 110. In total, we've had 444 individual cetacean sightings during 2021. And this has basically been undertaken through 39 dedicated surveys, which range from anything from an hour to four hours long in some cases. So what we hope to achieve with, with the data is something similar to what we did in 2020, where we logged the positions and any behaviors, et cetera, that we saw in cetaceans, marine vertebrates, et cetera. And we produced a map. And basically by producing a map, we can see how various animals use our coastline, whether they return to certain areas and any potential threats that might be impacting them within those areas. So as you can see, the map on the right-hand side of the screen basically shows last year wherever we saw a dolphin, where we saw whales, where we saw seals, etc. <coughs> so the voyage itself was split into three legs and the first leg um, wasn't fantastic for cetacean spotting, so whales, dolphins, etc. So this started in Folkestone in the southeast and we ended up in Glasgow. So basically what happened is at the very start of the voyage we had some pretty severe storms. We're going through force nine storms. Uh, when, when you're looking for a dorsal fin or a blowhole, um, very difficult to spot, of course. It can be quite dangerous. So that was a bit of a limiting factor. We also had plankton blooms, algae. Now, basically until this algae shifted, it meant that the fish, etc., wouldn't come inshore, which also meant that we had a lack of cetaceans. So likely as a combination of coastal algal blooms and also poor weather, 
basically meant that we didn't see an awful lot. However, by taking note of the fact that the weather conditions were poor, etc., that can then be used to enforce future data to say whether the likelihood of seeing things is lower or higher, etc. It wasn't all doom and gloom though. When we went to the Isles of Scilly, we saw ocean sunfish. Now these are big, huge fish. And we saw quite a few of them, quite a, quite a few very small ones. Now this was very similar to what we saw last year, where we saw lots of blue flowers again. So this could potentially mean that this area is quite important and it could be somewhere that we imply conservation in the future. So some of the highlights. So as you can see on the right hand side, we've got the divers and basically this green pea soup like see is caused by this massive algae bloom um which was a, a limited factor and obviously on the left hand side pretty severe storms this was going through a force nine on the way to cornwall so leg two so leg two began in glasgow and then we headed north towards portree so this really was fantastic. This was a highlight of the trip. Now we saw increased diversity of species. This tends to happen as you move further north anyway. We also had much better weather conditions, uh, which meant that the sea states were down, the swell was good, um, and we were able to see an awful lot more. Uh, we were also able to dedicate more time to the surveys, which was fantastic, because uh, we had longer days and stuff as well as the summer progressed, um, which was a bit of a shock. So we headed really really far out to sea towards St Kilda and Rockall, our, our furthest island in the UK. Um, now we expected the cetacean diversity to increase so we're going over things like sea mounts and stuff like that where we tend to see more fish and therefore you see more more predators such as whales and dolphins. But disappointingly we didn't see as much as we had hoped. Now this could be due to an array of factors such as fishing, uh, noise, stuff like that. We were shocked to see when we went to Rockall that there were three very large fishing trawlers operating within the vicinity, um, which wasn't great. Uh, but on the way back, returning towards St Kilda, we saw quite a large pod of longfin pilot whales, uh, which, was, which was pretty awesome, to be honest. So these are some, some of the images we captured. So on the right hand side is uh, one of the pilot whales that we saw. This is at four o'clock in the morning. Uh, which was definitely worth the early wake up call. Uh, on the left top of the screen, we've got a very small pod of common dolphins, uh, very playful. And just below that is a minke whale. Now that was on a fantastic day of sailing where we were traveling at about one knot, which is incredibly slow. And at one point we were actually going backwards, but the stillness and how quiet the boat was, was really good for these species because they're so sensitive to noise. So they came up to investigate us and it was really fantastic to see them so close. So then we started leg three in Portree and we finished it here in London. Um, so going around the north of Scotland, we did see quite a lot of uh, cetaceans up there with some quite large pods. Um, and we actually got an amazing opportunity to see uh, our first and only sighting of orcas as we came into the Orkney Islands. Um, and it was a really important sighting as we had a, a pod had a calf with them. Um, which is quite a rare thing to see as orcas have um, quite a high infertility rate because uh, they can accumulate pollutants in their blubber. Um, so it's really, really important that we saw one and that it's noted down and we can uh, potentially use that to track them in the future. Um, as we came out of the very north of Scotland into the North Sea, um, we did have some more variable weather conditions which led to our visibility off the ship being reduced to the point where we could only see probably a hundred meters or less from the boat um, and ended in the surveys being shortened or even canceled at some point because it was just getting a bit silly. Um, also coming into the North Sea, um, which is a very, very busy area of the UK um, with wind farms and oil rigs and drilling and there's lots of boat traffic. Um, we did see a reduced number of cetaceans in general. Um, and here we go. So it, on the top left image is the orcas, uh, you can just about make out the fin there. We have um, some white-sided beaked whales, and we have some, I believe they're pilot whales again. So um, there's lots of causes of concerns for cetaceans because they are quite a um, uh, delicate species when it comes to noise. Um, so they've had, in areas where we've been, we've had some sonar testing 
which is not very good for cetaceans as they do rely on noise to be able to um, hunt their prey. Um, this is also a problem when you have oil and gas drilling. Um, fish farms also make a lot of noise uh, as they try and drive away seals and cetaceans from eating the fish, um, as well as boat traffic. Um, um, in the future, though, we uh, hope to move forward onto our global voyage, uh, which would be we'll be able to continue our cetacean and marine vertebrate research, we'll be able to track some species, hopefully, um, along their large migration patterns, which would be a really awesome chance. Um, and we'll be able to get a better understanding of our central, of these central species. Um, so, we, yeah, we'd like to put forward a special thanks to um, every single person who helped with these cetacean surveys, not just the scientists, but a lot of the voyage crew got involved, uh, which was really great. And um, thanks to Rowan, who produced a lot of the photography um, and actually managed to capture some of these uh, animals on film that were quite far away. There we go. All right. Awesome. Thank you so much. Uh, to the cetacean team. I think we have one more team to check in with, our sea search team, if they're handy. I think we've got two, two more, more teams. teams. Two more teams, all right. Yeah. Yeah. So whichever one wants to go first. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, Joe. Hey, we'll take the hot seat next. Hey, Rowan, how you doing? Right, okay, let's find our presentation. Where's it called? Sea search. Okay. Right, can you see us all right and hear us okay? Yeah, good to go. Wonderful, thank you. Um, I'm Rowan Holt, I'm sort of dive leader uh, for the Pelican Voyage. Um, with me is Emma Eddy, one of our star divers. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, what we're gonna do is take you through uh, what the Sea Search program is all about, what, it's, what it does, and if, just a few of our results. We'll just sort of keep it nice and concise. So what um, Sea Search aims to do, it's, it's a citizen science project uh, that involves recreational divers. And what we do is gather information on the seabed habitats and marine life around the coastline of Britain and Ireland. Um, it does a, it's actually a structured training scheme for volunteers. So you can actually learn how to do this through, through a sort of training scheme itself. Um, the data that is produced is actually quite valuable to a lot of um, different organizations. And it can be used to fill in uh, knowledge and record changes in marine habitats and species around around the country. Overall, what the information is used for is for uh, management decisions and conservation activities um, from people like government bodies who want to protect sort of various bits of seabed around around the coast. The UK coastline does suffer from various impacts and just, just a few slides here of, of what actually has happened or is happening uh, from day to day. You know, we have overfishing where too much, too much fishing is done in any particular one spot. Uh, there are bycatch problems as well where the non-target species are brought on board and then just killed or discarded. And also some of the fishing gear that is used to catch our fish is actually very damaging to the seabed. Some of it is dragged along the seabed and that the, the left-hand side of the, the, the slide here shows some very delicate sea fans, which can get just basically smashed off the bottom by, by this sort of gear. There's other bits and pieces that we, you know, we're, we're looking at, things like habitat destruction, obviously pollution, litter, and we've, we've, you know, we've been mentioning plastics quite a lot in these presentations. And even just shipping itself can cause disturbance or has problems associated with uh, loss of cargo or, or uh, fuel contamination, that sort of stuff. And more recently, there's an awful lot of um, wind generation from uh, windmills being stationed at sea. And whether the, that has a negative impact or not is something worth investigating. Other little problems that we come across, some different sorts of scales. Uh, Non-native species, and by that I mean species that have come in from a different country that then flourish really rapidly on in our own sort of sea areas. And there's things like this slipper limpet on the left and sargassum or wireweed on the right, which is really sort of vigorous growing plant uh, seaweed that can overtake uh, a lot of native species. There's also the bigger sort of global um, environmental impacts that we're looking at and sea search data can pick out some of these things like new species that might have arrived naturally from the south that like the rise in sea temperature 
And there's also things like the disappearance of various species that may find themselves in water that's uh, too warm. We're also expecting changes in the climate itself with greater increases in number of storm conditions. And uh, you know, that picture on the right there shows the uh, southwest coast being eroded away by huge storms. Um, what has uh, what the the data that comes out of sea search has been really useful and has been used to designate various marine protected areas. So we can actually come up with marine nature reserves based on sea search data. Also, things like sea fishery boundaries, where you get um, zones protected from actual fisheries operations, and things like dredging in in the approaches to harbors can be limited or carefully controlled again, based on sea search data. I'll hand over to Emma. Um, Fred, we haven't got our map sorted yet. It's in, it's in prep, but uh, Emma will give us a little rundown on, the, uh, on, on what we've actually managed to do. Okay, so throughout our voyage this year, we've had a total of 10 participating divers, and they've come from all over the UK. We were fortunate to have at least five divers on each leg, which meant we had quite a few people in the water um, lots of eyes to look around, um, see everything that's down there and also help out with quite a few of the different things we did. A number of these divers were already sea search trained, but we managed to get four people trained up throughout the voyage as well. So that's great. So they can go home to their local areas and continue doing their sea search. Um, our dives lasted probably around 45 to 60 minutes. Um, and with that, it kind of meant we added up a lot of hours with our diving. So in total, with all of our divers together, with all of the dives we did, we managed 192 dives. Um, throughout the voyage, we managed to get in the water a good 36 times. And every time we did, we created a sea search survey and that all of that data is going to be submitted um, into the databases. As part of the dive team, um, we've also been doing some sediment core samples. So this is something that Joe and Janie from City to Sea mentioned earlier. Um, we were able to take um, some big cores of the sediment underwater um, to be taken away for a microplastic study. Um, we also did a small sediment sample for the University of Chester, which I think are probably looking at a similar, similar um, issues with the microplastics in the sediment. So, yeah. Right, I've got a, just a few basically pretty pictures of the sort of different habitats and communities that we saw when we were diving. And being divers, one of the things that we really like to see is look at reefs, whether they are natural reefs, uh, like this one here with a really luxuriant kelp forest growing on it, or sometimes artificial reefs like um, on, on wrecks. But some of these reefs are actually amazing. This, is, this one in particular is in the southwest of England uh, on the Scilly Isles but there's all sorts of different variations on themes here. That's how, just to put a diver in for scale, um, trying to get through a kelp forest is actually quite difficult. You do get a little bit stuck at times, but um, there's an awful lot of wildlife that lives on the kelp and on the seabed underneath the kelp forest itself. Things like this, this is a little sea slug, a uh, tiny little animal, only about the size of your little fingernail, but these sea slugs are beautifully colored they have really bright yellow stripes and things on them and we have lots of different species that are really cool and sometimes we've found areas that are in a little deeper water where there's really strong tides flowing you get these things which are soft corals growing everywhere now these soft corals are called dead men's fingers because they look a little bit like sort of ghoulish rotting hands <laughs> which is not particularly pleasant but they're actually really really pretty to see and some of the seabeds around the tide swept areas in Scotland are particularly rich for these really amazing sort of beds of soft corals. We also had a look at a few shipwrecks and these again have things growing on them and there's a sea fan there at the top of the picture that sort of twiggy shaped thing that's probably at least a hundred years old uh, they're very very slow growing and then these other sort of dead men's fingers, different sorts of um, soft corals as well, covering the wrecks. Sometimes we encounter sort of large and very um, recognizable species like this uh, edible crab. This was a real monster. Yeah, he was huge. I remember putting my hand as close as I dared 
to him just to kind of see how big the claws were. Yeah, I think the biggest one we saw. That, yeah, it was probably about nine or ten inches across across his body. <laughs> And then there's things that we looked at on sediment seabeds as well. So off the rock onto sand and mud and gravel, that sort of stuff. And there's a picture of Emma holding up an Arctic clam. Now this clam is probably somewhere in the region of a couple of hundred years old. These things are really, really live a very long time and they live just underneath the sediment surface. And they're so, so slow growing, but it's the equivalent of something like having a, you know, the age of an old oak tree. So these things survive and live for you know, a long, long time, but also very vulnerable to dredging activities. Other things we found on sediment, uh, things like these big starfish, quite big predatory animal that will sort of wander around and it actually eats smaller starfish. And then down in deep water, we get down onto really thick, gloopy mud. And in some places where there isn't any disturbance, we get these big sea whips or uh, um, sea pens sometimes referred to as they're filter feeding animals but they live just poked into the sediment surface and look really cool and quite big a few other bits and pieces there's a cat shark or dogfish you can choose choose your name for this species it has so many common names um, but they're they're really quite nice to see and one of our little specialities we've been seeing a lot of are these, these little tiny cuttlefish, which are really, really pretty. They're about the size of the end of your thumb. And if you annoy them, they squirt a little bit of ink at you and then zip off. So they're quite hard to follow and very hard to photograph. Um, quite an interesting habitat we looked at in Scotland were merle beds. Now, merle is a calcareous pinky red seaweed. And this is Kerry, one of the other divers, picking up a little fragment of it. And in ideal conditions where the water's really clear and there's a little bit of flow and it's not too murky, this merle grows all over the seabed. Um, but it's actually quite a rare habitat now. So we were fortunate enough to be able to find some of this. Other weird things that we did see, um, in some areas in the Scottish Sea Lochs, they have very dense brittle star beds. Uh, all these things here are filter feeding. There's a sun star there, and it's kind of obvious which is the sun star, surrounded by millions of, of brittle stars. But uh, these are quite rich areas, and uh, there's various other things that live amongst them, some, such as this uh, dahlia anemone, uh, amazingly colourful anemone there, that's just sitting there filter feeding and catching prey. And finally, some of these charismatic species turn up underwater if we're lucky enough there's a young seal pup here who turned up just to see what we were so that was a quick snapshot of uh diving around the uk i'll leave you leave you with that seal cheers Jim. thank you oh, all right amazing well as a diver myself i love seeing those images uh, i wish i could have been out there with you it looks absolutely incredible but rowan we're going to come back your way shortly i'm going to pop back on deck uh with Stu for a moment here Hey, Stuart, how are you doing up there? I'm very good. Well, I just want to say a massive thank you to all of the research teams for those wonderful presentations. Um, to, to everyone listening, all of that data, all of that information is actually on the darwin200.com website. Click on 2021 and um, there's interactive maps that are going live in a couple of hours, literally today, where you can click on and see all of those amazing findings with photos from each of those research teams. So a massive, massive thanks and congratulations to all of the researchers. Well, it's now time to, to talk about the next project, which is the Great British Water Project, uh, generously funded by the Don Hanson Charitable Foundation in partnership with Aquaphor and City to Sea. Over the last couple of months, 650 of these wonderful boxes have been sent by the Don Hanson Charitable Foundation to schools right the way across the UK. They contain an enormous range of resources and activities. They're huge boxes full of different bits and pieces for the, the children to, to undertake in different experiments. Um, the projects contain everything from, from start surveying pond life to exploring the chemistry of tap water, to looking if there's acid rain affecting different parts of the UK and many, many other interactive um, projects and activities. And all of that data is already live on the hansonbox.org website. Um, which you can go and see, www.hansonbox.org. 
as the data is quite complex, we've actually prepared a 15 minute video, then we'll immediately after that hand over to Dr. Jane Goodall. So um, here's a brief overview of what the schools, over 2,200 students all across the UK have achieved through the Great British Water Box Project. So, Joe, if you would British mind Water Project was undertaken by the Don Hansen Charitable Foundation in partnership with Aquaphor and City to Sea. Specially made Great British Water Project resource boxes were sent to 650 schools across the UK to undertake a series of experiments to investigate the chemistry of drinking water, the importance of freshwater habitats and ecosystems, the water cycle, and plastic pollution in our riverways. Over 2,200 young students have taken part in the activities so far, and about 500 sets of results have been sent in. The following is a preliminary overview of the findings of five of the main activities, namely a survey to investigate pond life across the UK, an analysis of the chemistry of rainwater to establish if acid rain still impacts parts of the UK, the blind taste test to investigate which water type children prefer the taste of, out of regular tap water, bottled mineral water or filtered tap water, an 11 in 1 chemical analysis of tap water samples and a plastics artwork competition to drive creativity. Further data sets continue to flood in from schools. For those schools still taking part, please do continue to send your results over the next term in the lead up to the COP26 United Climate Change Conference when the final results of the Great British Water Project will be presented. Schools across the UK took part in surveying their pond life to assess the biodiversity of ponds across the country. The basic methodology involved making 15 sweeps of a pond net, each sweep being approximately one metre long at different depths in an attempt to get a representative sample of the life in each pond. All schools were given a pond net and an identification guide in the form of the 2020 Local Safari book which the Don Hansen Charitable Foundation sent to each school last year. The schools that took part documented nearly 2,600 individual animals in their ponds. All surveyed ponds contained animal life. 36 different animal types were recorded in ponds across the UK, but surprisingly, most ponds contained very different assemblages of animals. Prior to the survey, it was assumed that ponds would show relatively similar assemblages across the UK, with a few outliers. But this proved absolutely not to be the case. While four animal groups stood out as the most common, namely back swimmers, tadpoles, water snails and dragonfly larvae, they were by no means in every pond. The lowest number of species recorded in any one pond was just one species, which were pond skaters. Pond skaters are one of the first colonizer species, so it would be interesting to know if this pond was set up recently. The highest number of species that was observed was at four schools. Each of these had eight animal species. All other schools were somewhere between these extremes. Most ponds contained very different assemblages of species, usually in relatively low numbers of individuals making up each species population. This indicates very good biodiversity nationally, as you would likely otherwise not see sustained reproductive populations consisting of small numbers of species across the country. So this is surprisingly good news. The other main point is the surprisingly wide diversity of several rare pond-dwelling species, including the occurrence of rare great crested newts. Newts did very well in ponds across the UK, especially the smooth newt. As amphibians with porous skin, newts are very susceptible to pollutants, so their occurrence across the UK is actually very good news. No strong trend was observed in the number of species in ponds in different regions of the UK in terms of biodiversity, 
except a general, relatively weak tendency for more species to be observed in the south. The other great surprise was the widespread and relatively large numbers of leeches found in ponds across the UK, with an average of 1.3 leeches per pond. While leeches may not be a popular pond-dwelling animal for their blood-sucking nature, as a parasite, they're actually an indication of a relatively healthy and stable pond ecosystem, which is reassuring. Several animal species were found in a single pond and not recorded in any others, namely stonefly nymphs, caddisfly larvae, and freshwater shrimps. No crayfish were observed in ponds across the UK, perhaps owing to their need for moving water, but freshwater mussels were recorded at three school ponds across the country. All in all, the results were very surprising in showing just how diverse the ponds of the UK really are. Schools also took part in the UK-wide rainwater survey, analysing the pH and basic chemistry of rainwater collected at their schools. The focus of the survey concerned pH in an effort to establish if acid rain, which was so prominent and notorious in the 1980s and 1990s, was detectable today. The schools recorded surprisingly diverse rainwater pH. The strongest rainwater acidity reported by schools was 6.2 on the pH scale. This reading was very widespread across the UK and actually represented by far the most common result, being over 57% of the rainwater results. Carbon dioxide is weakly acidic and dissolves in rain as carbonic acid. This mild acidity is more or less the natural pH for rain, which usually varies from low 6 to 7 on the pH scale. The great surprise of this survey was the recording of alkaline rain, with readings of 7.2 pH recorded at approximately 10% of schools, and 7.8% pH recorded at 6% of all schools. The occurrence of mildly alkaline rain was not expected and is often the result of emissions containing calcium or sodium. The rainfall chemistry tests revealed an interesting correlation between hardness and the higher alkaline readings. While not absolutely consistent, we did find a general trend that the harder the rainwater, the more alkaline the readings, which is to be expected. The high pH records were mostly supported by total alkalinity readings, with a general correlation visible, although some anomalous results can be observed in which low acidic pH readings also recorded high total alkalinity readings. The good news is that the UK-wide rainwater survey indicates that, on the whole, there is no evidence of significant acid rain. The highest alkaline rainwater readings that were recorded are perhaps more worrying than the highest rain acidity records, as the acidity lies within the natural rainwater pH, but the alkaline readings may well be evidence of pollutants. It is possible that the alkaline rain records are completely harmless, and the result of soil-borne dusts blown into the atmosphere that have impacted pH in similar ways to other parts of the world. The full sets of data from the rainwater survey will be presented in the autumn. The blind taste test was developed to directly compare children's preferences for tap water compared to filtered tap water and mineral water in plastic bottles. Do we really need all of those plastic bottles of mineral water? Or does tap water or filtered tap water taste just as good? Teachers anonymously prepared samples of each water type. So far, over 2,200 students have tested the three water types, bestowing upon each sample one of five possible grades, ranging from two smiley faces to two angry faces, resulting in a score for each blind taste test of between minus two and plus two, which was then recalibrated to a zero to 100 scale, where 50 is neutral. The clear hero of the preliminary results, we're pleased to report, was tap water, in relative and absolute terms. Tap water was rated the best tasting water in just over half of all blind taste tests done, with an absolute satisfaction rating of 66. 
all waters were rated above neutral, so the test showed that the UK students liked the taste of all three water types. Where filtered tap water was rated better tasting than normal tap water, the average tap water rating was in absolute terms just 54, a whole 12 points lower than the average. So filtered water outperformed where tap water tasted worse. Where filtered tap water was rated better tasting than bottled water, the tap water had the same average rating of 66 as in all samples. Tap water was rated as better tasting than bottled water in nearly 60% of the blind taste tests. As may be expected, taste ratings for tap water had significant negative correlation with chlorine and bromine concentrations as well as iron and nitrates. The taste ratings for filtered tap water did not show any significant correlation with those impurities, which goes to show when you filter tap water, the bad taste is successfully removed. The experiment ranked tap water very highly and students generally liked its taste. As may be expected, where high levels of chlorine were recorded, tap water ranked low in terms of taste. But where the tap water taste ranked low, filtering the water proved to eliminate the bad taste very successfully. In about two-thirds of cases, whether on its own or filtered, tap water was rated with a better taste test than bottled mineral water. The results seem to indicate that on the basis of taste, through a combination of tap water and filtered tap water, we can do away with those plastic bottles of mineral water. In addition to the blind taste test, the Great British Water Project set out to test the chemistry of tap water across the UK. 11 in 1 chemical tests revealed results for hardness, total alkalinity, total chlorine, free chlorine, bromine, nitrate, nitrite, copper, lead, iron and pH. All of the data is shown on the interactive maps on the Hansen Box website. It's fascinating to see how these results change by region and to correlate these results with the blind taste test results. Go have a look for yourself on www.hansenbox.org. We asked each school to test their water and double check their results in case of typos and errors. In addition to the results of the chemical tests, we also asked each school to send in a sample of their water, which can be further analyzed to make sure the initial results are accurate. Unsurprisingly, Half of the reporting schools showed a neutral hardness of 100 points. And of the others, a third were soft, which was 0 to 50 points, and two thirds were hard, which was over 100 points. Water hardness positively correlated to total alkalinity and pH. Reported pH levels range from 6.2 to 8.4, the minimum and maximum levels of the test strips. Only two schools showed high chlorine levels, the 5 to 10 milligrams per litre, which may have been caused by short-term measures taken by water companies after heavy rain to ensure the safety of their tap water. These can be re-measured now to check if this was a short-term issue. Bromine levels at 5 milligrams per litre were recorded at five schools versus the recommended maximum level of two. These were all schools which didn't have high chlorine levels. Nitrite levels were all fine. However, nitrate levels are also a current source of concern, with 15 schools at 100 milligrams per litre, double the recommended maximum level, of whom three were reported as 250 milligrams per litre. Copper saw three schools at 5 to 10 milligrams per litre versus the recommended two, as well as two hair-raising levels of 300, which we've assumed to be typos. Iron registered at 5 to 10 milligrams per litre, or otherwise were unrecorded. Lead results are a concern at this stage, with 70 schools recording 20 milligrams per litre, which is double the recommended maximum. 
and 22 scores reported 50 mg per litre and 22 scores reported at the 50 mg per litre level. Lead and nitrate levels, both concerns, correlated positively at 28%. The 11-in-1 chemical test results raised more questions than expected. Overall, water quality is fine, but some very high levels for some of the compounds tested were identified. Naturally, it is possible that the water may arrive at each school fine, but then may go through old piping, which may account for some of the very high levels of various compounds identified. Although, this doesn't make the results any less worrying. We're going to analyze the findings in greater detail, then present an update when all of the final data results are launched later in the year. And now to the results of the Plastic Artwork Competition. All right, what a great summary video of just an awesome project taking a look uh, at our waters, really cool. Well, our next guest joining us needs no introduction, but I'm gonna give one anyways. We've got Dr. Jane Goodall who's joining us. Uh, she's an ethologist and environmentalist. She's the founder of the Jane Goodall Institute and a United Nations Messenger of Peace. She's received numerous awards and honorary degrees, authored books for adults and children alike, and of course been featured in numerous documentaries, films, and founded the incredible Roots and Shoots program, inspiring students all around the world. So I am going to beam Jane in here right now. There we go. Good morning, Dr. Godal. How are you doing? Good morning to you. I'm doing fine. All right. Well, it's incredible to see you. Thanks so much for joining us today. I was listening to that summary of the water, which fascinates me a lot because this problem of water and tap water around the world. I've, I've learned so much about it in my travels and it is a huge, in some cases, a huge problem. So it's amazing that these young people are getting the opportunity to be exposed to these kind of ways of testing the water and learning about the water. And especially that we don't need all these plastic bottles. <laughs> but, you know, let me, let me address all of the in this extraordinary um, Darwin project. And I have to start off by thanking Stuart McPherson because, wow, what an incredible, amazing series of events and, and uh, programs and investigations and results you have launched, basically single-handed the idea. And so I, I want to start off by congratulating you on giving all these young people such an extraordinary experience. And I'm so envious. And thinking about the, the last journeys that you've all been on, on these beautiful, amazing ships, and the survey of the plastics, and the frequency of whales and dolphins, and the, the biochemistry of, of the water. And there was something else which I can't remember. Um, let's see, oh yes, the seabirds. And I think as everybody knows now, there are major problems confronting us today. And in fact, some scientists are going around saying, it's too late, we can't make a difference. We're on a <clears throat> downward trajectory, we've got climate change we've got loss of biodiversity. And while it's definitely true that we have all these problems, it's not too late, we've got this window of time. But the great thing is that in this window of time, it's desperately important that everybody takes part, that everybody understands that the way you live as an individual can impact the world. Of course it wouldn't if it was just you, but it's not just you, there's more and more and more people around the world understanding that every day that we live, we make an impact on the planet. And it was because of so many young people losing hope when I was going around the world lecturing before this pandemic, that I started the Roots and Shoots program that was just alluded to. And 
the young people in all continents were saying they'd lost hope because we've compromised your future. And we have. We've been stealing your future. We've created the world that you're growing up into. And when people say, oh, it's their responsibility, it's not, it's our responsibility. And we can go back several generations and almost since the industrial revolution or perhaps the agricultural revolution, humans have been upsetting the balance of nature. And, you know, there are these, these problems that we have to overcome if we're going to get through, as we must and we can. And first of all, we've got to alleviate poverty because if you're really poor, you're going to cut down the last trees because you're desperate to get more land and grow crops to feed your family or to make money from charcoal. And you're going to start overfishing because, again, you're desperate to feed your family or make some money. And if you're in an urban area, you're going to buy the cheapest food. You can't afford to ask, um, is it cheap because of child slave labor or unequal wages? Did it harm the environment? Was it cruel to animals? You're going to buy the cheapest just to survive. And then, of course, on the other hand, we've got to do something about the unsustainable lifestyles of so many of us. So many people have way, way, way more than what they actually need. And it was Mahatma Gandhi who said, this planet can produce enough for human need, but not human greed. And then finally, we have to think about growing population numbers, which I'm told is a sensitive subject, but it's fact. There's over 7 billion of us on the planet now, and already natural resources, which are finite, are being used up faster than nature can replenish them. And it's predicted they'll be closer to 10 billion in 2050. So if we carry on with business as usual, then I don't know what it'll be like. So we have to change. And I think this pandemic has helped people understand it's our disrespect of nature and animals that's landed us in this terrible situation with the pandemic affecting people all around the world. And that it's desperately important that we reach a new kind of uh, relationship with the natural world and with animals and realize that animals are sentient beings. So I wasn't planning to say any of that. <laughs> and really and truly, I want to be much more interactive with you. I want to hear about how it's been to be on this ship, how it's been to be involved in these projects, what you've learned. Has it changed the way that you'll behave in the future? Has it changed perhaps your idea for your career and what you want to do in the world. And I know three Roots and Shoots members have taken part. And I don't know, Stuart, how many of them. I know two of them were on a previous leg of the, of the journey. And one of you is, should be right there now. And that's, um, I can't pronounce your name. So will you introduce them to me, Stuart? All right, well, I'm gonna bring uh, that team in, Jane. Thank you so much for that great message. And we do have members of the team standing by right now below decks. So let me bring them in here. There we go. Hey, everyone. Hello. 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 I'm standing far away because I just had a piece of rough skin um, frozen off my cheek. So I look like a domestic violence victim. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll put lots of powder on it and sit far back I've got the mic near me, so I hope you can hear me okay. Yeah. Yeah. Good. Good. Sorry, I thought I should introduce myself. I'm Vikram. Uh, I think I'm oh, sorry, can you hear me? No. Uh, can you hear me there? Hello? Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> sorry. Um, okay, so I thought I should introduce myself. I'm one of, actually one of, the use, uh, one of the Roots and Shoots volunteers that has come on this amazing voyage. Uh, my name is Vikram. And I am, it's been an amazing trip, absolutely fantastic. I, I came on here just to study cetaceans and seabirds, but I got immersed with microplastics, with seaweed, with invasive species. There's been so many opportunities to really widen 
our understanding and our prospects of what is actually going on in the marine ecosystem and more than just the marine ecosystem but met all of the ecosystems that are interacting with each other and it's been just absolutely phenomenal well thanks for that so it's it's definitely been a highlight in your life right absolutely i mean it's <laughs> one of the most amazing opportunities i've ever had and it's, i'm not going to forget it anytime soon yeah i'm terribly jealous of you all by the way <laughs> something like this had been available for me but of course it certainly was not <laughs> <laughs> so, oh, uh, actually, I have a question for you. Um, as a Roots and Shoots volunteer, I've been able to go to many schools and talk about plastics and all of these massive problems that we faced. And it's so great to see the younger generation really being so aware and basically preaching to the choir. So I was wondering, do you have any suggestions or advice of how that we can reach perhaps older generations and people that may be more set in their ways? and if, because as you said, we need a collective movement of not just uh, younger people, but everyone. So do you have any ideas of how we can reach out to people of old generations, for example? Well, I have actually found through um, the many Roots and Shoots programs around the world, we're in over 65 countries now, that very often young people are actually changing attitudes of their parents, their grandparents. and. Um, I found that the best way to change people is to provide actual concrete stories, stories of what's happened, what you've seen, how you feel, how you feel about something. And the worst way to make change is to be aggressive, to tell people that they've got to change their ways, that it's their fault that, that we're experiencing the conditions we are now. You've got to reach the heart to change people, they've got to change from within. And if you spend a few moments thinking about the person you're talking to, try and find something that that you can both relate to. Maybe you both love dogs, maybe you both love being on the sea, I don't know, something. Just make a connection and then try and think of the right kind of story that involves what you want to change. That's the way that I've managed to you know, have influence on people from the top and the bottom. Amazing. I mean, that's absolutely fantastic advice. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you for the question. Now, who's next? <laughs> <laughs> um, hi, I was going to ask, I completely agree with your opinion about poverty being such an issue when it comes to conservation and that often people don't really have the luxury of the choice to actually make the more conscious decisions in their life. Um, and I know that a lot of conservation projects now are trying to be more holistic about the way that they try and make conservation happen. And instead of just displacing one problem onto another area, they're trying to come up with options, give people different industries to get involved with. So instead of having to uh, overfish a fish stock, they can maybe do a different industry to try and relieve that pressure on a fish stock, for example. Um, and I was wondering what you thought about that sort of strategy and whether you thought that was a good solution. Well, it's, it's some, it's very important kind of solution. Absolutely. And, you know, when, when I first went to Gombe to study the chimpanzees back in 1960, before so many of these problems had surfaced, although they were under, underneath, they were going on all the time. It's just got worse and worse and worse with more and more people and more and more technology and so on. And in 1960, Gombe was part of this great ecosystem of forests that stretch right across to the west coast in equatorial Africa. And by the late 1980s, Gombe was a little island of forest surrounded by completely bare hills, more people than the land could support, too poor to buy food from elsewhere, struggling to survive. And that's when it hit me. Unless we find ways for people to live without destroying their environment, we can't save chimpanzees for it or anything else. And so we began our program, which is called Takari, which is helping people find alternative livelihoods that work with and not against nature. And introducing things like permaculture, regenerative agriculture, and agroforestry, instead of just clear cutting, which caused terrible erosion and mudslides and actually wiped out whole villages. So now, completely changed. 
And we spend quite a lot on keeping girls in school beyond puberty, giving them scholarships. Because it's been found that all around the world, as women's education improves, family size tends to drop. Because, you know, most women don't want 10, 12, 15 children. That used to be the norm in that part of Africa. And once they have some uh, access to family planning, they can plan out the family that they can afford to give a good education to. And they want to. So that's not really answering your question. But in fact, it's very, very important for people to find other ways of living. You can't just say, you can't go on fishing here if they don't have anything else to do. And in some cases, this leads to horrifying results because of climate change. Just look at some of the films about Bangladesh, where the entire country is slowly being eroded away by rising sea levels. And I think it helps one understand that all these different problems are interrelated and we can't just tackle one. We've got to tackle them all. And fortunately, there are people working on all these different aspects that have led to climate change and uh, loss of species. And what's really important, which I, you know, one of the things that Roots and Chutes tries to do is to bring young people together to solve problems. And so if we can find ways of meshing together the people working on the separate problems, so that they see how these problems all interrelate, then, then we'll have a, a better world because we are doing a lot and it's not all doom and gloom. And there are incredible people doing amazing things. There's projects that restore nature to places we've destroyed, animals rescued from the brink of extinction. And, you know, so much good and positive is happening around the world. And we need to give space for that in the media, not only the doom and gloom, because the doom and gloom makes people lose hope. And if you lose hope, why bother to do anything? I mean, if it's not going to help, why should I bother? Why should I work? Eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow we die. So it's not all bad news. And a message for all of you is to share the good news. Uh, I have one more question for you, Jane. Um, I've actually been a big fan, a massive fan of your work, and hearing your stories about Flo, Greybeard, David, Frodo, all these amazing chimpanzees has been incredible. I was wondering, is there one chimp that you found had a lasting, like, as I um, had the ma biggest impact on your life? And, oh, and of course there is. You've <laughs> already mentioned him. Yeah, oh, is yeah. Frodo. David, Greybeard. David Greybeard. Oh, Very and the first chimpanzee who lost his fear of this peculiar white ape. <laughs> I mean, we are, we are the fifth great ape. I don't know if you all know that, but biologically, we are the fifth great ape. So it's us with chimps and bonobo sharing 80, 80, um, 80, 90, sorry, 98.6 of DNA we share with chimpanzees and bonobos next on the line comes gorillas and then orangutans so that's the progression of the great apes and we're one of them david graybeard taught me that chimpanzees use and make tools when i saw him on that famous day fishing for termites and that gradually as we learn more and more about how chimps behave like us pushing, embracing holding hands patting one another males competing for dominance swaggering with their hair bristling, shaking their fists, looking just like some human male politicians. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, sadly, they have a dark side like us, capable of violence and war. But they also have a loving and compassionate and altruistic side. And so they've helped us. And David Gravy really led the way. They've helped us to realize, first of all, we're different. What makes us most different? I think the explosive development of our intellect, which is at least partly triggered by the fact that at some point in our evolution, we developed this way of speaking spoken language or symbolic language. 
So that means we can teach people about things that aren't present. And no, we can't imagine any group of animals, although they're way more intelligent than we used to think, right down to the octopus. I'm sure most of you have seen um, my octopus teacher and we haven't do. But, um, you know, I mean, we've designed rockets that go up to Mars and the little robots been crawling around taking photographs of And we've seen the photographs of Mars. At one time we thought maybe it will be life will support life as we know it, but now we know it's not true. We've only got this one little precious green and blue planet. And how come the most intellectual creature is destroying its own ego? And it's a this disconnect between the clever brain and the human heart. I don't know why we seek love and compassion in the heart, but we do. And I think it's only when head and heart work together, work in harmony, that we can attain our true human potential and rise, lift ourselves out of the mess that we've made because of greed, because of ignorance, a lot of it's ignorance, and people wanting power and money and having a wrong definition of success. Success shouldn't just be about acquiring more and more wealth and more and more power. It should be about acquiring a decent life where you can look after your family or be looked after by your family. And having time to understand the beauty and the wonder of nature. So that's, that's where I'm aiming. We have to start somewhere. Mm. Jane, I just, oh. <laughs> oh. <laughs> oh, no, go ahead, squeeze one more in. Well, I just really wanted to uh, personally say thank you because I remember reading you when I was reading about you when I was a very small little girl and being so inspired by your work. And so it's an absolute honor to, to speak with you and, and to see you today. I just wondered if you had any personal advice or some of the hobbies you do to stay motivated because conservation can be a very heavy topic and as an educator myself it's trying to keep that motivation and hope going is there anything that you do to unwind and, and to keep the motivation going well i don't think i'll ever lose my motivation because i'm passionate i care about the natural world i care about animals and i'm very obstinate and i won't give up and i won't be i'm like one of those dolls that you push over and it comes back upright. <laughs> it simply won't be uh, pushed down as long as I live. And I don't know how long that'll be because I'm already <laughs> nearly 88. So come on. But as long as I live, I will go on fighting. So what do I do? Concentrate on the good news. When you feel down, and of course we all feel down. I do. Often you can't read about some of what's happening and not feel depressed. But then think about people who are fighting, sometimes giving up their lives to put things right, to protect the forest, the indigenous people in the Amazon, many of whom have been killed also in Nigeria, trying to protect the forest or other habitats. Think about the successes. And also, you know, I've, I've found that people aren't aware of the wonders of nature. I mean, I remember going through an airport, to see airports in America, and I noticed that there was two sparrows up, which somehow come in, you know, they do in some airports, and it was a female, and they were courting. <laughs> the male had seen a crumb on the ground, and he kept coming to try and pick it up. And as he flew back up because somebody walked by, she was fluttering her wings and of course he didn't have it and finally on the fourth effort he managed to get that from and feed that now that was a beautiful little display of nature and animal behavior and nobody noticed nobody stopped nobody looked. everybody's spending time on their stupid cell phones and ipads looking at video games you know so if you keep your eyes open to the wonders of nature, wherever you go, once coming up through the paving stones, um, birds doing special things, all that 
once you keep going, that you realize it's worth saving, it's worth fighting for, and you are not going to give up. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Well, Jane, on behalf of all of us, we all want to say a massive thank you for being here with us today. So thank you so, so much for your time and for sharing your inspi incredibly inspiring uh, knowledge uh, and inspiration for all of us. So thank you so much. Thank you. Yes, and I haven't been able to learn what you're doing, but I know that, that Stuart will send reports about <laughs> what's happening. Because, you know, questions coming up like, the whales and dolphins that you happen to see are there are there similar surveys that you can compare with are there more of them because of climate change and the ocean warming i suspect that's true all sorts of questions like that but i'll get them answered and um, <laughs> let's stay in touch if you want to ask more questions you will find a way to do it <laughs> brilliant well thank you very much from all of us no, thank, thank you as well. Thank you so much. And, you know, I'm glad that you're finding that this trip is immensely beneficial. And if you didn't, you shouldn't be on it. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, thank you so much, Jane. It was a pleasure. Well, it was great to see you all. And I'll say bye. Okay. Thanks, Jane. Thank you. Bye. 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 Oh, oh it's all right well that was pretty incredible thanks so much to jane for joining us and uh i believe we have two more uh presentations to check out before we wrap up today that, that's all if you want to stay there um yes that's absolutely right thank you so much jane and it was such an honor um to talk to, to wonderful wonderful jane she's such an inspiration to us all um we have two last elements of the the the, the, the lecture today um Building on Jane's wonderful work, we've been undertaking an invasive species survey, so we'll do that first. And then last, but by no means least, we have the competition winners with a thousand pounds of prizes from the Great British Water Box Project Plastic Artworks Competition. So I'm going to hand over to, uh, to, to, to over, uh, provide an overview of the plastics, of the invasive species uh, projects. So here we go. Thank you. Thank you. Cheers. Nice Oh, sorry, that was my bad. <laughs> Are we ready to go, Joe? Yeah, good to go. Okay, great. Um, well, hello, I'm Hannah Whitman. I am the science coordinator for Seize Your Future on board for the third leg of this voyage. And amongst other things, uh, one of the surveys I led was for the invasive species search. So this is for uh, the Capturing Our Coast project, which is run by many different organizations, such as the Marine Invaders, Organized, uh, the Marine Biological Association and Marine Conservation Society, amongst many, many others, collaborating together to collect data about invasive species around the UK coast. Um, and they currently have quite a lot of holes in their data. So we have come along to try and solve this. Um, Hi, I'm Paul Brazier, a marine ecologist. I've joined the Darwin 200 science team to uh, just provide assistance in all, all the different uh, sort of streams of science that's going on. Yeah, so um, on this project, we uh, were the way that the marine invaders data project can be collected is designed in a way that is called citizen science, which means that you can get anyone involved in this. They don't have to be a scientist, just led by scientists and guided by them. And so we were able to get a lot of the voyage crew people on, bo on board the Pelican involved, which is really nice and gave us a really great opportunity to make this more of an educational thing as well and really open the door to a lot of people to these marine threats and, and what scientists are doing uh, to try and monitor them and combat them. So, um in order to sort of uh, provide us a, a, a good understanding of, of where the invasive species are, um, we've been able to cover um, all three legs of the of the uh, of the voyage. Um, why do we collect this data? Well, the invasive species are uh, quite important in as much as they can be very impacting either economically or uh, on the ecology of, of uh, marine sites, and so we need to identify the pathways that those uh, invasive species come into the country by and the best way to do that is by identifying where those species are and and then 
looking further forward as to how they're arriving. Some of them can be particularly damaging. And so uh, if we can identify the pathways, we can avoid any future uh, sort of introductions of invasive species. So these are on, you can see on the screen now, some of the species that we've been looking for um, on the intertidal, uh, and indeed the divers will identify them through their sea search as well. Some of these, such as the wakami and the wireweed, uh, can grow very rapidly, can uh, cause considerable smothering of uh, native uh, habitats, if you like. So they can actually replace some of the native uh, species that we'll find along the coast. Other ones, uh, the harpoon weed, the, the hookweed, um, also can uh, sort of smother seagrass beds, for example, because they grow up very rapidly. Um, the carpet sea squirt uh, is, is particularly notorious for smothering uh, aquaculture oyster farms, for example, which can severely uh, influence the productivity of those, uh, those farms. Uh, and it is to be seen whether it will spread wider onto other aquaculture sites, which can cause considerable economic damage locally. Um, the leather sea squirt and the orange tip sea squirt uh, sort of can uh, sort of influence the local ecology. They tend to sort of uh, backfill uh, areas of space where other local species might might be present. And then the New Zealand barnacles, not considered really as, as damaging, but it's very highly abundant and is a very useful indicator. Uh, in in this particular uh, voyage, we found where where the limits were of its spread, and so that's a very useful indicator of the sort of pathways that might be um, bringing these introduced species in. So on the voyage, um, in total, we managed to do 21 surveys. It's really great uh, because obviously there's only so many times during the voyage where we got to shore and had an opportunity to do this. Um, and within those 21 sites, there were actually just two sites where we found invasive species present, um, which is quite nice. Like, as Jane was saying, it's nice to focus on the good parts to know that we aren't finding that invasive species, although they may be on man-made structures, aren't spreading into these open shores, the rocky shores around the UK. So that's quite nice to see that the northern regions, especially in northern Scotland, um, where other studies have seen that they haven't spread yet, that we can also confirm that, that we weren't finding anything much further north. Um, and it makes quite a lot of sense that we did find the, the invasive species on the south coast, as that is known as really the sort of landing point for a lot of the invasive species coming into the ports, coming up from Europe. And then they slowly, gradually spread north once they're introduced on the south coast. It just seems to be the general trend. So the two invasive species that we found were wakami and wireweed. So wakami um, is probably something that people know as it's in Asian cooking a lot and you'll see it in your sushi and things. Um, and so it's native in, in Asian waters, but in our waters, it has become quite invasive. So it was introduced in the 1980s, thought to be introduced uh, on shipping hulls and also from mariculture. And then that has slowly become more and more established and it's been found as north, I think it's got to northern England, but it hasn't been found anywhere in Scotland yet. And so it was good that we also found that, that we haven't seen it spreading any further. So it's nice to know that that's still the case and that it hasn't become really extensive and established further north. And then you have wireweed, which is um, very, very established down south. You see it on, on almost every single beach I've been to down in the south. So that is becoming a big problem. But we also found that going north, we weren't finding it, which is really, really good to see. It has been found as far north as I think just north of Glasgow um, on, a, on a couple of beaches and a couple of locks there. But um, we weren't finding it on the open shores and definitely up in Orkneys and Shetlands, which haven't really been touched too much by invasive species, we were finding were completely um, clean as well. So that's really nice to see. Um, so overall, this was this was really good, successful data collection that we did. And it's really nice to help the Capturing Our Coast projects fill in all of their gaps and and sort of bring this all together and keep it updated and monitored on the invasive species we're seeing in the UK. So thank you very much. Thank you. All right, thank you. And you're right, it is great to hear uh, that news that invasive species were only uh, spotted in two locations. All right, and I think it's time to talk a little bit about the contest winners. Oh, wow. 
<laughs> Beautiful. All righty, Joe. Can you? Is that coming through? Okay. Yeah, nice and full screen. Looks good. Wonderful. Well, one of the uh, projects in the Great British Water Project box, which was sent out to to 650 schools right the way across the country, was that they had to visualize the amount of plastic that one bottle a week um, generated. The Don Hansen Charitable Foundation supplied them with recyclable bags. And one of the projects involved, um, instead of putting the plastic uh, that was created each day into the bin, instead of putting it into the bin, they'd put it into these recyclable bags just to see how much it would accumulate over a week, two weeks, a month, etc. cetera. And um, as you can imagine, it, it might not seem a lot, just one bottle a day throwing it away, but over a month with 30 children, it can accumulate into massive quantities. So it was a really good way of visualizing just how much plastic um, was uh, we, we, a, an average person would generate. So one of the activities after that project was complete is to get kids to think about recycling and if we actually need those single-use plastics and, um, and ways to recycle them. And one of the ways we tried to do this was to encourage them to use the plastic as artwork. So across the UK, all over June and July, children right the way across the country have been creating amazing pieces of artwork out of recycled plastic to try and get them to think about recycling. And these are the top winners out of hundreds and hundreds. The Don Hansen Charitable Foundation generously awarded a thousand pounds in prizes. First prize being 300, second prize being 200, and third prize being 100, then 10 runner-ups of uh, four, 40 pounds each. So these are the winners out of all of those hundreds of entries. And I should say a massive congratulations to all those that entered because the entrants were incredible. And the amount of imagination and the amount of thought that went into these artwork competition entries was incredible. The very first place um, the trustees at the Don Hanson Charitable Foundation um, agreed on belonged to Grove Primary School. They created a really large, about two and a half, three meter long um, vessel made out of plastics, which symbolized a journey into the future um, where we have a more sustainable future with less plastics. So uh, the, the decision was that this received first prize place also for the sheer amount of effort and thought that went in to visualize this. So many, many congratulations to the students at Grove Primary School. The second place um, in the competition was awarded to Denstone Preparatory School um, for their wonderful abstract art piece using coloured cut, uh, cut bottles. Um, the trustees thought this was so imaginative and looked really, really great. And obviously it must have been a huge amount of work with all those children cutting up the bottles and making these. So a very, very big congratulations. All of the prizes are going to be awarded um, in vouchers so that the students and the, and the teachers can choose educational resources for their classroom. So many, many big congratulations to Denstone for, for, for winning second place. The third place was awarded to St. Simon's Roman Catholic Primary School for this really beautiful piece of artwork. The trustees thought, well, we're all, we're all unanimous in thinking that there's so much thought and care went into the design of this particular piece of artwork. Um, if you look carefully, you'll see these, these circles are the tops of various different um, plastic bottles and plastic containers. And it might not be apparent at first just how big this piece of artwork is. You can see these Pepsi bottle tops there, um, which makes you realize when you, when you see those, it's well over a meter, a meter and a half in, in width. So this was a lot of work and a lot of effort. We could, we could visualize all of the children sorting out the different colors. So a very, very big congratulations for the third place for St. Simon's, um, the students at St. Simon's Roman Catholic Primary School. The runner-up prizes, which are really fantastic as well, um, went to the following 10. In no particular order, all of them came joint runner-up prizes. So Mellor Primary School made this fantastic, um, there's a little fox if you see down there on the right, and the trustees loved the fact that this little fox was not only artwork but actually functional and had a lettuce growing in growing in his uh his top so um they thought that was very imaginative and many creative as well as the the totem pole and the the, the, the tower next to him um st mary's island church of england primary school um was awarded this runner-up prize for this beautiful rainbow as well 
um, the trustees thought, again, this was very imaginative and must have taken a great deal of work to select out all of those colours and choose the different plastic top bottle tops and pieces to make this uh, this beautiful recycled artwork. Um, the next runner-up prize went to the Barbie boat because this was not only inventive but functional. And I think Barbie seems to be really enjoying her, her journey in a pool here at Gray's Book Primary School. So um, the trustees all agreed that this definitely deserved a prize. So many, many congratulations to the students at Gray's Book, Gray's Book, Brooke, sorry, um, for uh, for imagining a wonderful boat for Barbie. I think it's anything any any respectable doll would be would be proud of. Um, oh, this was a wonderfully imaginative one. There were several entries um, from from Lord uh, Derrimore School um, of 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 creating hedgehogs and hedgehog homes out of recycled bottles. We chose this particular photo, but there were about 10 in the sequence. So we just wanted to emphasize that all of the wonderful children that created these recycled hedgehogs all deserve um, equal equal award and equal credit. Um, we thought this was the nicest photo of all because this particular little hedgehog was coming out out of a hedgehog house. So this is a very imaginative use of plastic bottles. So congratulations to the students at Lord Derrimore School. Um, this is, I would never have thought of turning a plastic bottle into a hedgehog. So many, many, many congrats to the students. Uh, this wonderful, I believe this is a koala bear from um, Freethought Community Primary Nursery School. Again, what an amazingly imaginative design, making a, ko a koala and also positioning him in his correct habitat up in the trees. So um, we loved the arms made of multicolored uh, bottle tops. And if you look carefully, you'll see that they're all beautifully color coordinated and symmetrical. And again, the amount of work and effort that must have gone into this really, really is, is wonderful. So um, Freethorpe Community Primary and Nursery School must have some very talented, talented uh, art students. So many congratulations. This, this uh, particular entry as well at Great Bradford's Junior School also really, really impressed the, the judges, not just because of the artwork and the thought involved, but the fact that it actually shows some of the problems that we're trying to address. You can see they've actually used bits of netting to explain some of the, the issues that oceans face. We all know that by 2030, it's believed that there'll be more plastic in the seas uh, than, than fish in marine life. So we thought this, this entry really, really, really shows um, not only a beautiful piece of artwork, but thought behind the artwork. And I have to say also with this entry, there was a series of beautiful pieces, very similar to from this, from the entire class. And all of the students that, that entered their entries all collectively win this award. So well done to all of, all of the, uh, the artwork from Great Bradford's Junior School. Oh, um, the trustees also loved this big turtle and particularly his googly eyes made out of, I think, washing up uh, liquid bottle tops. So um, big, big congratulations to the Castle Primary School for their wonderfully imaginative turtle and all of his um, different appendages made out of, out of bottles and bits of plastic. So again, who would have thought you could t make a, a turtle out of, of bottles? So again, a very imaginative, um, very, very imaginative uh, entry indeed. And I think this might be the last one. Last but not least, um, the trustees loved this this colourful tree made out of, or, or, or perhaps a bush made out of all of the different bottles and bits of cut up plastic. Um, again, who would have thought that you could create such a colourful piece of artwork out of recycled bits of plastic? So many, many congratulations. Congratulations to the students at St. Simon's Roman Catholic Primary School. I believe this was a different class from the, uh, the previous one. So, I, oh, I'm sorry, there's one last one. <laughs> oh, there's two more, okay. Uh, Crow's Thorn Church of England Primary School uh, made an entire wall of plastic fish, um, which the trustees loved, um, all individually painted with little plastic eyes as well. So we thought this, again, was an amazingly imaginative entry, and we love the wall uh, that the teacher created um, w to display them all. It's a beautiful artwork and a beautiful way to display them. So many, many congrats to the students at, at Crowthorn. And I think this really is the last one now. Um, St. Mary's Island Church of England Primary School sent us these photos, um, knowing that we were on, on the tall ship Pelican of London, um, connected in the Darwin 200 project, connected 
the Great British Water Box Project. So we loved their very elaborate and colorful sails. We've already spoken to the captain of our ship here to see if we could make some beautiful colorful sails just like this. We'll have to see what he says, but, um, but it's a very great way. And uh, we hope the students can test these boats out in, the, in, the, in a pond or pool and see how well they, they sail. We'd love to hear how, how they get on. So many, many, many congratulations to all of these incredible designs. And, um, and yeah, many congratulations to all of the students that took part. These are just a handful of hundreds and hundreds of entries from right across the country. So many, many congratulations. Amazing, Stuart. I don't envy the trustees at all having to make those tough decisions. Those were some pretty amazing projects. It was pretty amazing. Um, well, uh, if there's any chance you could just re-invite re me as a, 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 as a presence, uh, Joe, I just wanted to say a massive thank you to all watching. Can you see? Can you see me at all, or not so much? Oh yeah, yeah, you're right here, right front oh, center. Oh, oh, perfect. <laughs> okay, sorry. Well, that concludes our results event. Um, just to really emphasise a few last points, um, all of the data from Darwin 200 is available on www.darwin200.com. Um, we have interactive maps that will be going live shortly, literally in the next couple of hours today, and you can click on each map and click on each of the data points for all of the different surveys you've heard about today. And you'll pop up with windows and photos and text um, bits, which the wonderful research teams have worked so hard to prepare. Um, same with the um, Great British Water Box, uh, Water Project Box um, resources and activities. If you go on www.hansonbox.org forward slash water, all of the data is there and results are coming in. So to all schools that received the boxes and haven't yet submitted their, their result sheets, please continue to do so. We're going to um, finalize all of the data sets by, by the autumn and release it properly before the COP26 um, conference. So to all schools still undertaking the activities, please do keep sending your data in and we'll put your data onto the maps so you can see how your results compare nationwide. And the very last uh, point for me today is that just a reminder, the essay competition for the Great British Water Box Project finishes in October. So please do continue sending in your essays. We've already had hundreds of incredible and very interesting and imaginative and thought provoking essays coming through. So we're hoping students, when they get back after the summer holidays, can, uh, can, can create a few more essays and, and complete their, the, um, the essay competition. That also, as you may remember from the documents, have a thousand pounds in prizes. So we really encourage students to get thinking and get creative and, and uh, put forward their entries. Well, from all of us on the Pelican of London and from the Don Hansen Charitable Foundation and the Great British Water Box team, we all say a massive thank you for listening and watching. And we sincerely uh, look forward to, to, to all meeting again and doing another presentation in the future. Keep posted on the Darwin 200 and Hansen Box websites. And um, we look forward to, to speaking and providing more, more information shortly. So thank you so much for listening during this event and in particular a very very big thank you to the wonderful Jane Goodall for for joining our event today and and also to exploring by the seat of your pants for making the entire event possible so thank you Joe for for doing this today amazing Stuart well again a huge shout out to you a shout out to the whole team today for joining us oh. of course to the amazing Jane uh, absolutely incredible way to start the day today. I feel like we've just scratched the surface of this incredible 13 week voyage. So I'm heading to the website later today. I'm looking forward to the updates. Uh, Stuart, thank you so much and to everybody on the Pelican. Thank you. Have a lovely day. Thanks everyone.